so let's see. Um, we'll be switching back and forth between Tom and I, but uh, unlike other webinars, we're going to depend a little bit on some slides to help us uh, get organized and um, try to um, accomplish our two main goals for t today. Uh, and that is understanding how Arctos handles localities with four shared interconnected tables, uh, which we sh hopefully will demonstrate how geographic information is normalized across all of the Arctos collections. And along the way, we'll uh, help define geographic terms in Arctos and some of the geographic rules and um, uh, table uh, procedure, uh, best practices that we follow. So if you go to the second slide, um, there's a couple of, oh, sorry, slide two. Let's go back to slide two. There you go. Um, that's where, uh, these are some of the pages that are specific to localities in our handbook. And so there are handy references. Um, we'll also have these posted at the end. Um, and a lot of what uh, we're going to be spending time today talking about will be really more the database structure and um, the sort of geographic conceptual model that Arctos follows. And so to follow along with some of those, um, we have a specific page on, on trying to understand um, the, the geographic uh, data in Arctos. So these are our two main reference points um, that are in, located in our handbook. So on slide three, on the next slide, yeah, this figure is from one. It's from our handbook, and this illustrates uh, really best the uh, four interrelated tables that um, Arctos depends upon. Um, so you can think of this as sort of a, a, a spatial stack of um, geography that uh, is assigned to each specimen, and we'll go through each one of these tables. Um, uh, in the rest of the seminar to really understand how they are uh, independent of each other and how they're dependent of each other. But um, let me just spend a little bit of time talking about the four in an overview. So the higher geography table at the top, um, oops, oh, there we go. Um, it's code table controlled. Uh, we have limited access to edit this table. Um, but all um, cur curators in Arctos can select uh, um, a higher geography combination. So this is uh, where we um, string together continent, continent country, uh, otherwise known as the administrative level zero, um, state or province, you know, otherwise known as the first administrative level, and for countries that have well-defined and uh, commonly referenced county or other sub-provincial units, um, or in other words, uh, administrative level two. Um, and these are associated with specific localities. So that is in the second table. The locality table is actually the table that stores the geographic uh, coordinates. So this is where we have um, both the uh, specific locality, a textual description of where the specimen um, was collected or at some event occurred, and associated with the, the specific locality are not just the georeference but and the coordinates for mapping those, but also all the related information like uncertainty, um, there could be elevation and other associated remarks. Um, the collecting event is generally thought of as the unique combination of the locality and a specific date. This is also where we store all our verbatim information. The specimen event is actually the table, the means we link a collecting event to a specific um, specimen. And hopefully we can show you how all of these four tables uh, connect to each other and are displayed in specimen details. The second part will, uh, uh, the second uh, webinar will show how we edit each of these functions. So in the next slide, uh, let's go back to higher geography. 
and talk about that specifically. So as I mentioned, uh, higher geography is where we uh, have um, our authority uh, files for um, all the information that's uh, basically above the level of a verbatim locality. Uh, so that will be things like continent, country, state, province. Uh, could be it could inc also include district and county, um, and then for islands we also include islands and island groups as potential uh, as potentially part of higher geography. And these are shared across all of Arctos um, collections. Um, we also can include alternative names, alternate alternate languages, uh, common um, different spellings depending on you know how it's been uh, um, transliterated. Um, and these just inc increase discoverability. Um, these can then be found in um, all the search uh, fields. Um, and obviously many localities share the same higher geography. So can you switch to um, our demonstration? Um, yeah, uh, so we have to, uh, yeah, so there an you example go. that we have um, of <clears throat> a couple of examples I'm going to show you. Here's uh, one locality, which is a province, uh, Isfahan province in Iran. Uh, so you could see that this higher geography is uh, this particular province in Iran contains four localities um, in the database. Uh, which are linked to four collecting events, um, which are impacting or are associated with eight specimens. Uh, one from CHAS, entomological collection, six uh, herb specimens from the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, and one observation of a herb specimen. Um, so this, um, as Michelle already mentioned, there's uh, a hierarchical uh, structure to this entry. So uh, we're in the continent of Asia, in the country of Iran, uh, in the state province um, searchable um, Wikipedia link is Isfahan province, um, which uh, it actually has several different spellings. And if you can see, um, there's also um, associated geographical search terms that would get returned could be spelled Isfahan together, Isfahan, uh, Isfahan, Isfahan with a PH, um, and Ostana Isfahan, and even in, in Arabic, in Arabic, um, in Persian uh, spellings. So um, all these, all these higher geographical entries are, um, have links to an authority. In this case, we have a, a Wikipedia and, uh, entry for Isfahan province. So if we uh, open that up, we can look at the description and much more detail about what the province covers, it's, um, et cetera. The um, other um, thing is that we also have in the same uh, stream, we have um, automatically populated a Google map with all these specimens and the collecting events that are associated. So we can, um, we can look up the associated specimens through those, through those, uh, um, within those, within that locality. And of course, just like with any Google map, I can switch, switch different, um, types of views, uh, labels, etc. So uh, uh, in this case, right in, in my screen, because I work. Do you have the example right? of? Yeah, so I was going to say, do you have a, the example from New yeah, Mexico? So what I was going to say is in this example, I can't look up MVZ specimens because I'm logged in. Um, you can see it here. I'm logged in uh, with my permissions. Uh, which are limited to MSB, but um, I have another example of uh, higher geography here from New Mexico, which is an entry for Guadalupe County, 
uh, which is a county in the northeastern part of New Mexico. And very similar setup. You can see in this case, we're talking about 149 localities within that county that exist within Arcos. Um, so this higher geography impacts 1,122 specimens from speed, uh, different collections, both different museums, bird, fish, herp, and mammal specimens at MSB, uh, some specimens from MVZ, University of Colorado Museum, um, UTEP, and these are our um, uh, Earth Sciences collection here. So uh, very similar, continent of North America, country United States, New Mexico, Guadalupe County, entry to Wikipedia. Uh, one thing I want to point out in this case is we actually have um, a well-known tax polygon formatted here as well and it in, the, in the entry. So um, the, as some of you that work in GIS will recognize that WKT, uh, it's a standardized way of, of so essentially it's a, it's a um, markup language for GIS systems, so you can you can import and export things really easily, and things are well defined um, uh, between different systems. So in this case, because I uh, I am with MSB, I can look into some of the some of the specimens um, that are associated with with these entries. View where they were, right? on herb specimens, I can identify some of these um, specimens of art um, here, snakes and so forth, fall in within this geography. So this is uh, this is the higher geography uh, uh, part. Um, so the table that describes a, a higher geography uh, at three different at three or, or uh, more different levels. Now we go back and uh, move on to the locality table where your geographic coordinates, um, latitude and longitude, and other information, Michelle. Thanks. Uh, so as Tom just mentioned, this is where we store the geographic in, uh, coordinates, uh, usually in latitude and longitude, but it can also accommodate UTMs and different forms of uh, latitude and longitude, um, not just degrees, minutes, uh, degre decimal degrees, but also degrees, minutes, seconds. But in order to have them mapped, they should be converted into decimal degrees. So we actually have little um, uh, uh, easy to, um, a little calculator to easily convert those to decimal degrees. Um, we also store all the uh, information surrounding georeferencing. So that would be storing the method, the datum, sources, uh, and the remarks. Um, we also include um, elevation or depth, um, and as I mentioned, the specific locality. Um, we are, uh, the localities should also, you should also know that we are also um, constantly, um, Arctos is constantly referring to various Google Maps and spatial services which can georeference and reverse georeference um, localities and make suggestions to help um, uh, curators um, increase the spatial um, accuracy and precision for their localities. So even if it does accompany them, um, you can always sometimes improve on them or uh, if there are mistakes, um, Arctos will give uh, curators flags and, and, and um, give you suggestions um, on how to fix those. So those are really important to be able to store those. And that's something that the locality table is um, uh, tapping the web services for. Um, we also have uh, uh, some special um, uh, location, geolocation uh, buttons. Um, so there's links to Berkeley Mapper, links to Google Maps suggestions, as I mentioned and a link to geolocate, uh, which we will go into much more depth in part two. So I'm not going to, we're not going to go through um, all of the different functions in the locality table, but there, it's quite rich. Um, if Tom can switch over to our Arctos demo again, 
we can step you through a locality edit table um, and show you all the parts for a locality uh, table. So, uh, Tom, if you could um, walk us through this again. Um, but I, I, I think, at least for me, it was difficult to hear you. So if there's, you could do something about okay. your mic or bring it is closer. That, is that better? And that might be easier to hear you. Is that is that better, Michelle? Yeah, that's okay. better. Um, not sure if that has to do with my headset. Um, yeah, it's okay. better for me. Great. Thanks. So uh, again, very similar layout, except in this case, we're talking about uh, a locality um, entry or a locality table. So um, uh, remember from the higher geography, uh, higher geographies were linked to, in many cases, uh, many localities. So here we are in this locality entry, uh, locality 10087057, which um, corresponds in this case to four specimens at MVZ. Now, at this level, um, I'm still able to edit localities um, and so any sort of red boxes um, <clears throat> will show me, the up here, will show me what um, specimens and where these locality pertains to. So um, this locality is linked to higher geography in Guadalupe County. Um, the specific description is 4.5 miles north and 3.0 miles east of Santa Rosa which is in the, the east central part of New Mexico um, where you can see <coughs> the decimal the latitude and longitude um, has already been entered and determined. Um, this locality is linked to an event uh, that happened on the 19th of June in 1978. Um, this uh, locality, this, these Coordinates, I should say, were derived from uh, using geolocate. And as Michelle mentioned, we're going to talk about georeferencing in a separate webinar. Um, but they were determined to have a, about a 1165 meter error around these coordinates. And again, they're mapped to Google Maps, so we can zoom in and see. Uh, what it is that we're talking about uh, in here. Um, and uh, we have uh, also the Berkeley mapper link to um, and perhaps Michelle you can you can explain this a little bit since I don't have the right permissions for the for the MVZ specimens here to pull that up. Um, I, I, I think you might be able to, but uh, the Berkeley Mapper is a um, is another uh, service that we have. Uh, Berkeley Mapper has a few nice embedded um, tools for um, checking out different specimens. So um, if you have uh, more than one specimen you want to map out, um, Berkeley Mapper will allow you to do that. Uh, so you'll see Berkeley Mapper links, obviously, on the specimen detail page, locality page, as well as specimen result searches. Um, there are uh, measuring tools and, and alternate base maps that you don't have from the plain Google Maps um, uh, interface, uh, the service. So, um, so it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit more specialized to Natural History Museum data. Yeah, um, thanks. I, uh, I just realized because I want wouldn't be able to do that with the MVZ specimens. So, um, uh, but okay. So this is strictly again. This is strictly the locality right. table. Yes. So that that's sorry. Just a sorry. I, I'll just make a little clarification here. So um, this is a good demonstration of how Tom, being uh, not at the MVZ, he doesn't actually have um, specific. Um, access to MVZ related um, specimens because of the spe specimen event table, but he does have the ability to change um, the locality and the georeference. Um, he can create um, a new locality and associate it with his specimens 
if he wants to and needs to change specific things in the locality table. So um, this is just one of, uh, it, it's a nuance um, here that uh, can be quite powerful because um, of the way we're sharing um, some components of the geography and, uh, but allowing curators to only have control of their own specimens. Yeah, so uh, this, uh, yeah, exactly. Like Michelle yeah. said, this is the, the nice thing about that is that um, this takes advantage of sort of local knowledge uh, so that, you know, even though this is a different collection, I can I can make modifications and, and suggest, well, you know, if, if the specific locality, if I, there's something I know more because um, of my familiarity with the local geography, I can make suggestions for MVZ to correct that. Now, um, maybe for the next for the next uh, collecting event, I can pull out one of the herpetological specimens from our collections, and then show you based on that how that works. Um, so, Michelle, can you talk about the collecting event for a little bit? Yeah. So, good segue. Now we're in collecting events. <laughs> So collecting event um, is also collection controls. This is where we store all the verbatim information. So this would be sort of the warts and all data that you would get from a collector, perhaps from his field notes or from his field tags. So verbatim date, um, for uh, which oftentimes, uh, as a curator, you would translate into a begin and end date. Um, the verbatim locality text. Um, and then the coordinates, which are not necessarily the same as the coordinates that we're, use, we're using for mapping. So these may be in an alternative uh, coordinate reference system, um, like in UTMs, uh, or they may be in a different um, geographic format, like decimal uh, um, uh, minutes, for, for instance. So this is where you can still store all the original information that you uh, got, uh, that you received from the collector. Mm -hmm. um, we have a couple of examples for uh, collecting events um, that uh, I think Tom hopefully will have fire, uh, fired up here. Now this, these are um, collection specific. So he has control over his own collecting events, and, and, whereas I don't. Collecting events are also, the collecting event editing tables are also a little bit different in that there's multiple ways you can actually get to a collecting event table. Um, so one way may be um, through a specimen uh, results so I'm gonna table, which is on mine because I don't have right now. To the MVZ and um, we'll show so, you. But let me just uh, show you, for example. Yeah. Right. So one of them, one of the first ways would, oh, sorry, if you go back to specimen results, let's go back to specimen results briefly. Um, if you could look under the manage drop down window right here, and you go down to spec collecting events, let's just hit, yeah, oops. my Firefox does it all the time. And you scroll down to the bottom, you should be able to see all the collecting events that uh, that are in your result table. So you can see that there are um, different specimens, and there are different um, collecting events, which have um, different specimen event types and um, different uh, dates and localities. So you can go through here and get to a collecting event editing tape form. I'll let you walk through folks. Um, and again, this, so this, this is, uh, it seems if, you, if, you, if we look back to the general structure of how uh, these tables are related, remember that locality happens um, at a collecting event, uh, which happens during a specimen event, and the reason we have sort of it seems it seems awkward to have a, diff, a, a an extra table because some databases link directly specimen events to localities, 
but the reason for having that is to allow us to have localities as something that is fixed and shared between collections and between museums uh, rather than collecting events which are limited uh, to particular um, collections and collecting events can have multiple specimens obviously but they can also happen at localities that um, or or I should say uh, there might be information in collecting events that is not standard enough uh, to a locality. So essentially this allows us to, to, to make sort of a, a separation between individually controlled and available information to the collection and uh, um, information that's associated with locality which is standardized across collections. And it's, it's as we mentioned before, the collaborative spirit of this is that uh, we can then edit localities and standardize localities because oftentimes uh, collectors will describe the same place um, in different ways. And so I'll go back here. Uh, this is just one one collecting event in, that describes one of our herb specimens. Uh, in this case, uh, the verbatim locality is a minor road south of Highway 156. Verbatim date is translated to standardized computer date. Um, and then uh, we have a locality that's associated with this with this event in Guadalupe County. So, um, so this um, this is the collecting event. We go back to the um, to the presentation. The uh, collecting event is is table is controlled at the collection level and those records are then linked to specimen events um, which are which are assigned so Michelle all right so specimen event table this is what's um, somewhat unique to Arctos and uh, it sometimes takes a little bit of time to wrap your head around but this is how we uh, relate a collecting event to a specific specimen. Um, this is where we can store collecting method, sources, uh, nicknames. Um, I'll show, we'll show you examples of that. Uh, this could also talk about the um, habitat the, that's specific to the specimen. Um, so you can think of it as a microhabitat. Um, so a collecting event may occur in a, in a, in a larger geographic area but um, the specimen event um, might define, you know, the, the trap line that was set in a riparian uh, zone versus um, along a tree line. So the uh, being co collection specific, this also allows us to um, impose some other extra curatorial controls, um, such as a verification status, and that will prevent um, other people, even within the same uh, collection and institution, um, accidentally overwriting specimen events. Uh, so this can always be reversed, but those extra steps of unverifying a, a, a specimen event actually has more than once sort of um, allowed us enough pause to decide whether or not we really wanted to uh, change a locality or change a collecting event. And certainly, after you've spent a considerable amount of time, let's say, with your archives or talking extensively with collectors, you may want to um, make sure that there um, is some sort of um, indicator that there was extra effort and um, validation applied to that specimen event. So uh, having um, specimen events verified um, is, really, is really useful. Um, you could also have multiple specimen events associated with a specimen, and some of, the, some of those specimen events may be accepted and some of them may be unaccepted. And we'll have a few examples of that. Having multiple specimen events um, associated um, are really very uh, specific use cases, um, and sometimes it's really uh, useful to show sort of its past legacy of um, specimen events that have, for one reason or another, 
um, changed its status and is no longer valid for, um, for mapping and use. So we have, uh, usually these are associated, I think, with um, legacy um, uh, localities, at least in the case of um, MVZ. So we have a few examples of that. Let's take a look. Uh, sorry, Tom, I'm making you do double duty here. <laughs> so, um, so here we are. Here's an example of. Uh, okay. Yeah. So. Let me just make sure that this is uh, easily seen by everybody. So this is an example of, of a bird from the Chicago Academy of Sciences, um, where. Um, is an yeah, you'll have to go into uh, um, one of your specimens, oh, though. Exactly. What's that? I said to show a specimen event table, I think you'll have to go to one of your specimens so we can just see the specimen oh, event table. And um, I'll, uh, I can show these examples um, at yeah. the end. So uh, specimen event. Um, yeah, so you go to that herp specimen there. Example. I choose, oh yeah, I could choose one of these specimen events, right? So, yeah, so you're just going to go to the locality button table. We'll, we'll um, show some more examples of this in this, just a second. But let's just see if we can yeah, go into the edit. So here is a specimen event, and uh, <clears throat> you can see in this case, there's a, associated with this specimen, it's a collection type of event, uh, but it, it could also be, and this is what Michelle was trying to get at, is that there might be more than uh, one event associated with the specimen, and for example, if there's multiple sampling from an individual. A good example would be, uh, uh, let's say that uh, if there's a snake that was captured as part of a diet study, uh, and so uh, you know maybe the snake was captured, uh, there was a radio placed in it, and uh, there was some blood taken for isotope analysis. Uh, well, that blood sample is is part of a specimen, uh, and maybe you know it was consecutively sampled for several years until the snake was found dead, uh, and uh, deposited as, as a specimen, and so you essentially end up with two or three blood samples in addition to the body of the snake, uh, and all those things are just one specimen, but they're multiple events, right? So, um, and that's why there's that's things such as encounter or observation or even use of specimen uh, could be recorded as a specimen event. Uh, in this case, this is a collection event uh, collected by Caleb Lochran uh, a couple years ago. Uh, this one hasn't been verified with, with um, yet, but, uh, and of course it was, this event is linked to a collecting event uh, that happened on the 27th of September 2009, uh, and um, associated with that collecting event is a locality which was then determined um, to be part of the higher geography in Guadalupe County in New Mexico. And uh, so here's, here's one example. Um, I wonder if it's, um, if I can see uh, perhaps a mammal, uh, mammal sample here, um, or so if you if you go back to the slides, I think we've got some uh, right. links right in there, Tom. And we can go to the next slide, and that'll give us yeah. If you just go back to our slideshow, um, 
The next slide has links embedded in it. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So we're going to uh, spend some time now just going through some specific examples to highlight how some of these tables and some of the decisions at the individual table level can be um, visible in the specimens themselves. So, um, so first of all, we'll just give you one example for um, from uh, this uh, from this particular specimen uh, that's a, from MVZ. Actually, if you're logged out, you should be able to see this just fine. We're just going to the rest of this um, are mostly publicly available information to help you understand what you see when you when you do um, ARCO searches. So on this one, this is a, a towhee, spotted towhee from uh, Hastings, our field station. And um, we're going to focus really everything that's the rest couple, uh, the rest of these examples are we're going to focus on this location table here, which is really an amalgamation, a summary of all the different um, information we're gathering from our sort of spatial stack of tables. So you can see that there's um, information um, that is uh, been verified. So we can see that it has a big green box around the whole table here. Um, and there's information here from almost all the four tables we've talked about. So you can see higher geography. That's in the higher geography right there. You can see some determination type, which is actually coming from your specimen event table. You can see verbatim locality next to specific locality. That those are coming from two separate tables, the collecting event and the um, locality table. You can see, obviously, specimen event information here um, and collecting event information from by the date. And we, you can see then all the coordinate information that comes from the locality table. And like I said, um, there's a big green box around the whole table because of this verification status. Um, and if you scroll down a little bit, you can actually see that there's an unaccepted um, specimen event as well. Uh, and that really had more to do with um, some legacy cleanup of the um, information and standardization um, that, that we applied um, as a collection to how we were describing things from our field station. So that, that's the main reason why these were, um, uh, the previous specimen event was um, unassigned. But for us, it's important to see those unaccepted older legacy specimen events because then uh, if we happen to see references to Hastings Reservation 25 miles of southeast Monterey, we'll understand that um, that's actually been changed. So that's uh, the location. Um, in the last part, and I will also then uh, refer to some questions that we received in the chat window or uh, topics that came up. Um, if we could uh, go back to the slide so you can find the links to some of our specific examples. The one example I wanted to show was how multiple collecting events from a, the same individual may apply. And in this case, this is not my museum. MSB kindly supplied this example. Um, we have a Mexican wolf uh, recovery program, and they have collected several different um, blood samples over the years. And so if you scroll again into the location table, you can hit expand. You can actually go through um, several of those collecting events. Here. So if you just keep scrolling down, you'll see that there's different um, dates, different accessions were applied through the years. Uh, and they're all accepted because they're all valid it, um, and they're all kind of separate collecting events. They're this all is sort of events. what I was trying to say beforehand is. Um, so that's one use of, case uh, of. Um, 
uh, thing where you know the blood sample was taken several times from this wolf and sometimes in a captive facility, the wolf management facility of the Sevilla, and sometimes at the actually in a free ranging wolf uh, in the blue mountain range, uh, blue, blue uh, mountains. Um, so it's called the Blue Range Wolf Recovery Area, which is in, in um, west central part of New Mexico. So um, all these blood samples and, and sightings and, and capture, recapture, they're obviously uh, part of the same individual. Therefore, uh, this same individual just has one catalog number. Another um, example is yeah. yeah. So our second example is showing. Sorry, sh showing. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I go think ahead. There's Tom. a there's a Was delay, sure, a little ahead. bit of a delay in in audio. So go ahead. This is an example of a host parasite. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> sorry about that. So yeah, so this is a host parasite. I'll just uh, this example was chosen because they're sharing um, an event, and actually there's uh, um, some nice arctos because we're it's sharing all these different locality tables um, when data is being entered for one, and you refer to uh, the location of a different specimen, in this case host versus its parasite, then all the appropriate shared locality information gets also associated with the parasite. So that really reduces the amount of data entry and the opportunity for transcription errors. So these are not, these, these are, uh, not separate events. Arctos recognizes that this is actually the same, the same event. Um, so this is a good example where sharing um, the information can also uh, reduce the curatorial burden. Um, the, the, it just so happens that the host and the parasite are in the same uh, institution, MSB, but they could also have easily have been um, a host and a parasite in separate institutions in Arctos, which is often the case. And then my last example um, is just a specimen detail that um, is worth pointing out. So in this particular MVZ herp, you can see in our location, it's, it hasn't been, the verification status still remains unverified, but you can see there's now a green box around our Google Web Services, and that's because the coordinates are in the same WKT polygon that it states it's in. So in other words, you know, we have uh, a coordinate and a polygon compliance, um, in this case to Riverside County. And because of that, that kind of increases user confidence in the coordinates. And um, we can put a red box, uh, sorry, a green box around that to signify that quickly that this is a this is a uh, a coordinate with a fairly high degree of confidence around it. So, um, alternatively, if you were to look at a um, another locality or a different specimen, you'll see that there may be not a happy green box, but a red box where the coordinates do not occur within its stated higher geography. And since it hasn't been verified, this would be a good flag for um, a curator to go verify and check out. So I'll have something to do after the webinar. Yeah. Especially because this refers to a salamander. Um, All right. That's so, supposed to be collected from a slough uh, somewhere, either on the east side or west side of the river, right? 
so you can uh, you can make some. Yeah. Well, there there is a slew there, and I should also say that since I can see the um, the manner in which it was georeferenced, this also doesn't give me a high degree of confidence. So I will probably have yes. that redone. So yeah, it was done as you can see in a batch mode. Um, so that's this happened in some of our earliest um, pertinent um, efforts. Uh, where a lot of things were batch uh, georeferenced uh, without regard to the specimen or the species, so um, so they they were good first passes, but um, obviously we can improve on that uh, particular uh, georeference. So that's like I said, we have a good flag for um, checking that out again. So I just wanted to. Um, Kind of wrap up. There's a couple of other questions that occurred um, during the course of our presentation. So let me go back to a few of those. I wanted to make a, a, a mention about features. Um, features is a really great, great question. Features are associated with our um, higher geography table. And generally, we, we have features because there's a lot of um, geography, uh, specifically polygons, that don't easily fit into um, a hierarchical model of country, uh, state or province, and county level. So in other words, you may have um, geographic features like um, the Atlantic Ocean or perhaps um, a particular watershed, which may um, cross over several different counties and states. Uh, you could also have administrative features like a national park or a national forest, which again also may uh, include more than one county. Um, we also may want to uh, find more easily certain uh, uh, localities that are assigned to only features and not to things like counties. So for instance, Alaska doesn't uh, use counties, they use um, a lot of quadrangles. So that would be um, a more appropriate use. So some of these features we've actually turned into um, controlled um, drop-down menus, so you can search by those. Um, some of the features are things that we add upon request, especially for geographic features. Um, so you may find Yosemite Park um, as a feature, but there, it may be assigned to more than one higher geography, uh, depending on which county. Uh, in the park it is. So we have a lot of different um, uses um, for features and other features gives us that flexibility um, for when we, we need to um, include something that may not fit um, uh, easily into those administrative boundaries and, um, and standards. So does that answer, um, it may have brought up more questions than answers about features, but um, I'm happy to also address that uh, some more. So if, if somebody wants to jump in, feel free. You can turn on your mic, I suppose, too. Yeah, at this point, I'll um, unmute. I'll um, turn on people's microphones if you'd like to ask a question aloud. Um, just make sure to click on the little microphone at the top of your screen, and it will turn green. And then we'll be able to hear you. There was another question. Um, I'll uh, yeah. I'll keep going through the. Oh, no, sorry. perfect. I was going to say there's some other questions that came up. Yeah, I was. Yeah, so I was just going to keep going down the list. Um, but like I said, um, feel free to jump in uh, verbally. So let's see. Uh, there was also a question about. Um, it looks like you you already answered the questions about localities um, being locked for editing. So I'll skip to Carla's question. Is there a way to search for non-compliant coordinates that don't fall within the polygon? That's a good question. I'm not sure if I want to do that personally, because <laughs> I will. Uh, but uh, uh, yes and no. So I yes, there is a way of doing that. Um, but a lot of it's also dependent on uh, whether or not we have WKTs um, added for every polygon, and that 
is it's not something that we have done systematically um, yet. So uh, a lot of the geography, I should say, uh, um, in Arctos, and when I say geography, I, I kind of mean all the um, tables that are related to uh, spatial information, um, is in a constant state of you know improvement. So uh, that is something that you know we've we've talked about but haven't implemented. So I think you can do that, but you know that doesn't necessarily mean that it's non-compliant. It also could just mean that we don't have any um, we don't have any WKTs um, uh, available for that polygon. So. Uh, so, for instance, when you are doing a geography search uh, specifically for, I think, um, collecting, uh, sorry, higher geography um, and localities, uh, this is something that you need to be logged in with permissions to, to edit geography, by the way. Um, then you, there's a tag, there's a little toggle where you can um, um, search for things that have WKTs and things that don't have WKTs. Um, but yeah, that would be probably a good report to, to have on a regular basis. So I can imagine if you had a specific um, county you wanted to search for um, uh, coordinates, then maybe we could have a report that just automatically gives you the coordinates that don't fall in a, in a given WKT. Okay, thanks. Yeah, can you hear me? Does that makes sense? Yep. Um, yeah, I have yeah, one other, just a minor that. question on that um, that TOEI example under verification status. It had said former verification status verified by curator. Why is it former? <laughs> That's the first time I've noticed that. Here, let me go back to that. Let me go back to that. It's a former status, a not a former curator, right? <laughs> Well, former verification, yeah, that's very confusing. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Um, I just kind of noticed it myself. I don't think I noticed it. Right now, it ha it's, it says former verification status because someone had put in specimen event remark former verification status. So I'm not sure why they did that, because that's sort of redundant. Um, but uh, everything after specimen event um, remarks is what verbatim is put into that field. So currently, this is maybe a question for the bird curatorial manager, <laughs> collections manager. Somebody put in former verification okay. status. And I, I really don't know why. Um, because obviously you would flip it from there. So I think it's just a, a matter of the student um, or whoever, what, the curatorial assistant who had entered in the data, they felt um, compelled to, to put it in there. I'm not really sure why. But anyways, um, I can That's easily okay. remove it because it's just a text field. That's all, that's all it is. I Like I said, I didn't... I didn't notice it before. If you uh, uh, reload okay. that page, it's gone now. So that's that's that, that's a demonstration <laughs> about how easy it is to change things when necessary. Okay, so if you like, I said, if you do a hard refresh, you won't see that again. Um, hmm. Yeah, that was from the uh, curatorial assistant. Um, any other questions that uh, that we uh, about things that we covered? Things that maybe we weren't clear enough. And um, if there are specific questions you would like to see, use cases you would like to see in part two, let us know. Leave us a chat, send us an email, and we'll be sure to cover it uh, next month. Thanks, Michelle and Tom. Um, I'll just let more questions trickle in, but I'm going to post that link to the uh, IDIG bio survey. If you could just all take, you know, it, t it takes one to two minutes to fill out. And it's really useful for us. So if you could please remember to fill that out after, that would be great. Um, if there's any last questions, yeah, and as Michelle said, um, we have part two next month, so if you think of any questions between now and then, we can be sure to incorporate it in the next webinar.
Um, but thank you, you guys. That was very helpful and uh, useful for everyone, I'm sure. Yeah, thanks, guys. No worries. All right. Well, thank you. Sorry about the technical difficulties at the beginning. We'll figure it out one day. <laughs> Great. We'll see, see you, you next, next month. A few weeks. <laughs>